a little bit about what we're here for today. Um, this is a Learn at Lunch um, series that's held by the US Consulate in Sydney. And usually um, something like this would be happening in person um, where professionals from different backgrounds come together to talk about various topics. So in the past, we've talked about entrepreneurship, women's empowerment, political satire. And so we're really excited to bring the same series, but virtually. Um, and the purpose of today's Learn at Lunch is um, around World Press Freedom Day. So on Sunday, um, it was World Press Freedom Day, a day to support a free and vibrant open media as it is vital for democracies. It's also a day of remembrance um, for those journalists who have lost their lives in pursuit of a story. Um, so just a little bit of housekeeping before we begin. Um, everybody's put on mute um, and we'll go through some questions that have been pre-submitted by you guys already and then um, we'll move over to the audience for questions. So if you have a question, um, you can go through to the Q&A um, button on your screen um, and you can put up your hand um, and submit a question either in the chat or over there and then we'll call on you to ask that question. Um, so without further ado, um, we'll go around the panelists and we'll just ask you to give a brief intro about yourselves and your work. Uh, good morning. Hi, um um, Connor, uh, Connor Duffy from the ABC. Sorry, Paul. Um, okay. Was getting in with the first question. Um, I'm the National uh, Education and Parenting Reporter at the ABC. I've just um, returned from three years in the US and have previously reported from Southeast Asia, uh, South America, uh, Canberra, Hobart, uh, Townsville, all sorts of weird and wonderful places. That's great. Um, good morning. I'm Paul Giblin. I'm um, an officer with the U.S. Embassy, in particular the uh, U.S. Consulate here in Sydney. I've been in the State Department for two tours now. Uh, before that, I was a, a journalist with uh, several newspapers, the New York Times, among them uh, a large paper called USA Today, um, some other smaller papers that you haven't heard. I um, covered immigration and investigations and then went to the State Department route. Cool. So um, I'd love to get to know a bit more about your background. So Connor, um, you mentioned that you recently came back from the United States. Um, what's different about covering news in Australia as compared to over there? Um, everything. Um, the, the short answer. Um, I think um, the US is incredibly fortunate to have the First Amendment, um, which uh, affords journalists incredible freedom. Um, that we just don't have here. Um, defamation laws are the bane of our existence here and um, they're increasingly being weaponized um, and used in different ways. Even companies now are trying to effectively sue for um, defamation by finding various torts uh, and other technical legal matters that they can use to suppress um, reporting. We also, I think, have um, a culture of secrecy more so than the US. Um, there was news today about a defamation trial involving um, one of Australia's most decorated ever soldiers who's um, suing the newspapers now owned by Channel 9 and that's now going to be held, it looks like, in complete secrecy. Um, that's a civil case, not a criminal case, um, which is something I can't see happening, couldn't see happening in the US. Um, so for me, reporting in the US was um, a real breath of fresh air. Um, you know, I, just before I went over there, I'd come out of a long defamation battle and um, going over there, um, I went and visited the First Amendment Centre in Nashville. Um, and, you know, I'm a real, really, really strong advocate for greater freedom of the press. And I think if Australia wants to continue to have an independent press, we need to do a lot better. Yeah, well, on that, um, we witnessed, you know, the AFP raids last year of ABC officers, um, and that really caught, you know, a lot of um, issues to the forefront, whether it be deficiencies in our implied um, freedom of political communication and a lot of our laws around national security. Um, what did that raid say to you about the fate of journalism in Australia? And what do you think needs to change um, to facilitate moving forward? Um, well, personally, I'm, you know, I'm obviously not an impartial um, observer in commentating on this, given I work for the organisation that got raided and I know the two journalists and, um, you know, I have a lot of sympathy for them, given they're still in the position of not knowing if they're going to face 
um, criminal charges. But again, that was a, a situation to me that would be unimaginable in the US to have um, the FBI um, raiding the New York Times and certainly um, the amount of um, intelligence that um, was given or shared with reporters um, in the US on a fairly routine basis over here, um, you know, would likely see a situation similar to what's happening with the um, AFP action against the ABC and also the AFP raid on News Corp. Yeah, um, Paul, just on your career, um, a really interesting career that you've had, um, you know, from winning a Pulitzer Prize to, you know, working in diplomacy. Um, why don't you talk us through a little bit of those kind of key moments that you've gone through and how's that transition been from, you know, um, journalism to dealing with, you know, misinformation in state owned media um, as a diplomat? All right, um, but let me just back around a little bit. The, uh, the First Amendment that Connor was referring to is uh, the First Amendment to the US Constitution. Um, the First Amendment is more than 200 years old. It guarantees five rights. It's uh, press, speech, religion, assembly, and the right to sue the government. And so that's where all the, the press laws are based in the United States, that they, they come from there. And I was fortunate um, in the United States to have that um, umbrella. Although it, um, the laws vary from state to state in the state where I was primarily working in Arizona, um, it's fairly good. It's, um, the press rights are, are stronger there than they are in, in other states. And um, I think part of the reason is that um, in Arizona, we sue the government fairly often um, about press, press rights when they try to withhold information or that sort of thing. I thought it was useful to sue the government and just to remind them that they have to abide by the laws. Um, that was part of my work with um, that won the Pulitzer. I was doing an investigation into a sheriff there who was um, enforcing illegal immigration laws, federal Ill illegal immigration laws. Arizona is a border state that's right above uh, Mexico. And with a, with a, a collaborator, uh, we documented uh, 669 arrests that he had done and we built a database and we were able to track his work very closely using public records that we got using a public records law. From there, we were able to show that he was breaking federal law. In the United States, it's illegal to arrest someone for the way they look. And it was fairly obvious, it was completely obvious that he was arresting people for driving while brown. He was arresting Hispanic people, whether they were um, U.S. citizens or, or, um, or Mexican citizens, based on how they looked as they saw them in the cars. Anyway, so uh, that was useful. And now that I'm on the other side, working for the government, I think I'll be able to do a lot of the things that I had hoped the government officials w would have been doing while I was a reporter. And I think one of the, the fundamental things is knowing what the law is, knowing what the expectations are, and then working with them. Yeah. Um, so I guess on that, we've talked about the Australian and the US landscape. Um, how big of an obstacle do you think big government is on the freedom of the press when reporting human rights violations? So we're seeing that kind of all over the world, whether it be with the Uyghur population in China um, or in Kashmir in India. Um, what are your kind of thoughts and comments on that? And is it applied to the United States or elsewhere in the world? Elsewhere in the world or even in the United States? Well, as I mentioned, uh, one of the nice things in the United States is you can sue the government to get public records. And generally speaking, public records are kept on those sort of um, big issues that you mentioned. In other places around the world, there are no such thing as records. There's no such thing as a court that's going to help you get there. And working with your sources, sometimes sources will put their lives in danger if they speak to the media. Sometimes members of the media, their lives are in danger. So there's a, a vast difference from country to country. Yeah, and both of you have kind of worked in, you know, local media outlets, um, as well as, you know, those national stories. Um, what are some of the differences and the opportunities that you've seen there? What do you have in there, Connor? Um, well, I think um, the really interesting thing with local reporting um, is that, you know, I, I personally think it should be mandatory for everyone starting out in their career. Um, because you have to be in the community that you're reporting on and see the person you've written about uh, the next day at the shops and, um, you know, be, you know, really be part of the community in, in every way. And I guess you have greater and more instantaneous accountability um, 
to the community that you're serving through your work. Um, one of my early journalism experiences was covering a Category 5 cyclone in far north Queensland um, when I was based in Townsville. Um, that was 2006. And then we set up a one, I set up a one person bureau in the Innisfail Town Hall to chart um, the community's recovery. And um, that was, yeah, really, really informative um, experience for me. Um, you need sometimes do tough stories on people and um, to chat about it the next day. Um, yeah, and I guess you're, you really see how everything works on a, on a personal level. And to me, um, it was an invaluable way to start your career. And I think it's an invaluable service still. And it's a shame that um, in both Australia and America, I think we're seeing a lot of those outlets close and the ABC having its funding guaranteed by government, we still have a very strong regional network, but uh, you know, just in the last couple of months, we've seen huge amount of newspaper closures and um, as well as training you know, the next generation of journalists, they're providing a, a huge and valuable service to their communities. Right, and another aspect of that that I found is when you're covering local stories, those can blossom into national stories. For instance, the Joe Arpaio immigration story that I worked on, that was just a, a local story. I started going to press conferences and seeing the sheriff talking about uh, his efforts on immigration. And you know, when I'd ask him follow-up questions, he didn't know the answers, which prompted me to get involved in that story. And that led to a change in federal policy. I mean, it was months in the, in the making, but it led to a change in federal policy. Um, another story I worked on involved um, veterans, uh, a lot of whom were serving in um, Afghanistan, and they came back with injuries, and they weren't being treated at the veterans' hospitals. And that story started in Phoenix, and that spread all, all around the country. A lot of newspapers jumped on board with that one, and that led to uh, changes in federal policy. And um, also F-35, the, the fighter jets, which Australia is buying a few of these, um, a lot of them were based in Phoenix. And so I started covering them just because they were in Phoenix and I was able to, sh to show that these things were way over budget, uh, they were way delayed and, and uh, they weren't that operational either. So that led to another national story. So I think, as you said, you, you start on these local stories and they can turn into a national story. And what you learn covering the local stories, um, you can apply to any story. Meeting contacts, as you said, that sort of thing. Yeah, and so kind of on that, I think you touched on that, Connor, um, we actually have a question from the audience is, how can we keep freedom of press alive when a lot of professional press outlets are either closing and journalists are getting paid less and less for what they do? How do we maintain that integrity of the press that we've always known about in the past? Yeah, um, yeah look, that's a great question. And I wish I knew the answer. I think whoever comes up with the answer to that will be a very successful entrepreneur um, running news outlets uh, in this day and age when so much of their traditional advertising revenue is going to either Google or Facebook. But I think um, here in Australia, it just reinforces the challenges that we already have. Um, at least when the media was stronger, we were much better prepared to be able to put money into a story that we knew was likely to result in a defamation action or that we knew was going to um, take quite a lot of time and resources. And increasingly um, we're seeing um, journalistic outfits, even you know, really now in the cities as well, um, increasingly stretched and increasingly concerned about taking on those risks. Yeah. And Paul, um, we actually have a question about kind of how you were dealing with the local community um, when you were dealing with your Pulitzer Prize story. You know, how do you deal with that kind of backlash from local authorities? Um, and is there kind of that risk of self-censoring when you're kind of intimidated by all of that? That's a good question. Um, that topic um, did incur a lot of backlash. It's, it's a tough topic to get into immigration in the United States. Um, there's strong feelings on both sides. Um, I made it a point when I was covering it, particularly when I was at these uh, demonstrations, I made it a point to go to a lot of demonstrations and I would um, talk to the, the, the protesters, the people in support of uh, easier immigration. So I'd stand on their side and I'd make sure that the police and the sheriff saw me speaking to these people. 
And then I'd walk across the street and I'd talk to the sheriffs and I'd make sure that the protesters saw me doing that. So I wanted both sides to know that I was talking to the other. Um, I hung around a lot. I went to um, any kind of meeting. Uh, at the time, I didn't know Spanish, so I re relied a lot on, on translators and uh, people got to know me. They, they recognized me. I sort of stood out in those crowds a lot of times. And I just wanted to be known. There was a lot of backlash after the, uh, the stories came out. It was a series of 10 stories over 10 days. Uh, there was um, people say they're dropping their subscriptions, and I suppose they did. I was spotted sometimes in public at the grocery store and, and that sort of thing. I remember once I was, um, we were having a bit of a family reunion and we went to a particular hotel and we were just at the pool having drinks and stuff and some guy had too many drinks. So he came up to me in the, in the middle of this family gathering and, and, and that sort of thing. Um, I was followed by the sheriffs uh, for at least several weeks. Um, you just deal with it. You have to be prepared for it and deal with it. It's yeah. something that maybe not everyone's comfortable with, but is okay. Yeah, um, I guess kind of moving on to the landscape of journalism now, um, how do you think technology is changing journalism, both in the way that it's consumed and in the way that we're, you know, creating and putting out stories? We've seen a rise of citizen journalism quite a lot. Um, so yeah, what are your thoughts on that um, in that current landscape? Um, well, I think the barriers to entry have come down massively. Um, you know, when you think about 15, 20 years ago to run, you know, a newspaper, you needed a, a printing press. Now you can run a blog. Um, back then you needed a TV station to air your work. Now you just need a YouTube channel. Um, with When you used to need a radio station, now you can set up a podcast and it seems like everyone in the world has one. Um, don't know if that's entirely for the best, but um, anyway, we'll filter through to the good ones. But I think um, in some ways technology's made, you know, our jobs uh, easier. It's also created this very strange environment where people are consuming more of our products and more media than ever, but uh, yet we can't find a way to make the business model um, sustainable. So it's a um, kind of a, a two-edged sword, I guess. Yeah, I, I agree with Connor. In many ways, it's it's better. Uh, technology has made things faster. We have a greater reach, that sort of thing. But I think it's also diluted the product. Before, you used to have people who were in journalism and grew up with journalism and, and knew the practice and knew the standards and the expectations and how to do journalism. Now you have some guy who's running Bob's Basement blog, and he's not adhering to the same standards, and he's putting his substandard work out there. And a lot of um, news consumers don't notice where they're getting their news from. Are they getting it from uh, a real reliable news source or are they getting it from Bob's basement blog? And I think that is a, a very serious problem in journalism right now. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think we'll open up the questions to um, the audience. So if you'd like to answer a question, you can just raise your hand um, and we'll um, put you through. So we have Reshma who has a hand up. Um, can we get them unmuted? And you'll need to also unmute yourself. Yeah, I think you're on. So you can ask your question now. Hi, thank you so much. Um, I actually had two questions. Um, the first one, I think any of you can answer. The first one is, have you ever had any editorial pushbacks from your organizations with regards to any particular story that you wanted to run, but was against, you know, the company's policy? So that's question one. And question two is, how is advertising revenue impeded, um, you know, freedom of press? And what is the alternate business model? Because today we can see that, oh, re you know, advertisers are coming in way of editorial decisions. So do you, do you have any alternative business model in mind, the way media can run while, you know, you know, sort of um, keeping the sanctity of um, freedom of press? So that's my two question. Thank you. Um, I'm happy to, to jump in first. Um, thanks for those questions, Reshma. They're really good. Um, look, I can honestly say I've never had any uh, editor at the ABC tell me not to pursue a story or to frame it in a different way. Um, the biggest, the only real obstacles I've had are, are legal ones um, in terms of having to perhaps dilute a story or um, leave part of it out, depending on that strict legal in process. And I think that goes to the freedom of the press uh, stuff. But, you know, the editors I've had at the ABC have been great, very 
encouraging and very um, willing to take on controversial subjects, even when they know there's going to be considerable blowback um, and also willing to, you know, deploy people across the world to dangerous um, situations to get stories back to people through Australian eyes. Um, on the question of advertising, I, I'm not really in a position to answer that one. I'm not trying to dodge it, but I've had my whole career at the public broadcaster and we're entirely funded um, by the Australian taxpayer. So I, um, yeah, I'm just probably not the best person to answer that one. Um, to take a stab at that, I have had some stories that I've backed off from, but not because I was getting outside pressures because they didn't turn out to be what I thought they were. And I think uh, a journalist has to be brave enough to invest some time and energy into a story. And if it's not panning out, just tell his or her editor, sorry, this, this is not what I thought it was. It's not, it's not a story. So I've done that a number of times. You're going to take some wrong paths as you're going. Um, yeah, I, I, I totally agree with Paul too. I just wanted to jump in there. And I've, I've been in the position of having spent, you know, a few thousand dollars on a story and having yes. to um, have that uncomfortable conversation of, the, you know, to this what I thought added up just doesn't. Um, so we got to pull the pin. Right, right. Um, I was fortunate to work for generally large news organizations where there's a, a, a division between the editorial staff and the advertising staff. And we made it a point not to know who was advertising or, or, or that sort of thing. They would make some concessions. For instance, if you're doing a story about plane crashes and, and we had a, a, an ad on that page from an airline, they would make sure that that ad and that story wasn't on the same page. But other than that, uh, no, not in my experience. So we have a question from Tal. Um, how can traditional media survive in the we media era, especially in the context of fake news? Uh, sorry, I'm, I'm perhaps so out of touch that I, I'm not quite sure what the we media era is. I think a, he's referring to citizen journalism and things like that, if I'm correct, or I might not be. Oh, okay. No worries. So, and sorry, how can we, how can traditional media survive as all these other <laughs> yeah. competitors and stuff are rising? Well, I think um, going back to Paul's point, um, I think, you know, consumers should be able to trust us um, that we are applying a more rigorous um, set of standards to our reporting. Um, we have the code of ethics, which we adhere to. Um, the ABC is um, very consistently ranked the second most trusted institution in the country after the High Court. Um, so, you know, fake news is a huge issue and it's getting more and more sophisticated. Uh, it's getting closer and closer to resembling news copy. Um, so if anything, um, you know, I think that's a reason to continue to get your news from us. Um, and, you know, while citizen journalists may not, um, you know, always have the same level of training and standards, they may have access to particular topics or communities that um, can make what they do very worthwhile? I, th I think that's a difficult question, one that journalism as a whole has been trying to figure out for the last 20 years or so. Um, it's, it's tough, it's tough. Uh, we don't have the, uh, the big supermarket ads or the, the car dealership ads that were uh, supporting newspapers in many ways for, for years and years and classified ads, just people advertising for help wanted jobs and. And, and use cars and use cameras or housing for rent, that sort of thing. Those are the ads that sustain newspapers for decades and just decades. And now we've lost all that to, to monster.com and to Craigslist and to Facebook and those sort of things. So it makes it tougher. Uh, what we're seeing in the United States is um, just super rich people now are investing in journalism. They're buying newspapers. Jeff Bezos, uh, the owner of Amazon, uh, for instance, bought the Washington Post. He just wrote a check and bought the entire newspaper. And then he put a lot of resources into it. I'm sure he's uh, losing money every year on that adventure, but there he goes. So I think we'll see more of that. I hope we'll see more of that. I, I don't know what the, the long-term answer is. That That's something that we've been trying to figure out for quite a while. Yep. Um, so we have somebody else who's raised their hand, um, Zia. Um, yep. Yeah, so can we get you in and please remember to unmute your mic before you ask your question. Yeah, uh, my name is Zia. I'm from Australasian Muslim Times, Amherst. Uh, I'm just concerned about uh, the press freedom in India. Uh, India being uh, the largest democracy uh, has slipped behind in its uh, world freedom index rankings. 
Lars uh, slipped to about 142 um, out of 180 countries. And especially in terms of Kashmir, we know that uh, it's like a closed area and we are not getting any news out of Kashmir for the last eight or nine months. Uh, why this contradiction being the largest democracy and not of being able to uh, get news from one state uh, of that country? Thank you. I just have no expertise on India, so I'm gonna defer on this question. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, Zia. I am in a very similar position to, I've never actually even been to India, um, but I, I am vaguely aware of the restrictions in Kashmir and I'll, I'll just go back to, um, you know, the importance I think of having a first amendment or having some kind of constitutional protection. So, um, you know, government governments of the day can't do things like that. Yeah, thank you for your question. Um, please do remember that you can um, raise your hand and ask the question live. Um, otherwise, we'll move on to another question that we have. Um, how will COVID impact press freedom and the reporting of human rights infringements? And that is from Dean. Well, um, go right ahead, Connor. Oh, no, you go, you go, Paul. Oh. Um, it, it, it seems to me that the worst of times brings out the best in journalism. In America, I think back to 9-11, what, what a catastrophe that was, and, and I thought the, uh, that brought out some great journalism. Um, before that, uh, we had a president who uh, was forced out of office, a president named uh, Nixon. Um, and I, thought, I think that brought out the best of journalism, just a, that, that whole situation. I think COVID is doing the same thing. I think we have people who are working remotely, um, sticking with it. And I think the journalism that I see as I'm sitting here in, in Australia reading the American journalism and, and the Australian journalism as well, I think it's all, it's all very good. So I, I think these kind of things work that way. Yeah. Um, yeah, Dean, I, I would say that COVID poses um, challenges for us as news gathering organisations like no other. You know, we're, we're prepared to have people in the field, in conflict zones, um, in, you know, our natural disasters, um, very, you know, um, hazardous places. But um, COVID has meant us pulling back on some of our international staff, um, which, you know, we're, they're doing their best to cover that remotely. But, um, and I think, uh, as Paul said, it will um, make us step up and bring out the best in us, but it is, a challenge unlike one we're used to dealing with. Um, you know, journalists are used to taking on risks, but this is um, something that we just don't understand enough about yet. And we're having to basically evolve our news gathering organized, news gathering operations basically every day. Right, and if I could just add, a lot of the journalism that happens is behind the scenes, stuff that people don't see. It, it's reporters on the telephone. It's reporters going through records and just, just that ugly, boring stuff that they don't make movies about. And, and that can still happen. And it is still happening. So we have um, a question about what would the American landscape media look like if it had a national broadcaster like the ABC? Um, and that also within the context of this idea of um, polarized media within the American landscape, I think, you know, we kind of see different parts of the media having kind of picked sides. So, you know, what would having a national broadcaster look like in that context? You know, it's kind of hard to imagine really in America, there's a national public radio and, um, PBS, Public Broadcasting, something, whatever the S stands for, and those are uh, federally funded outlets. And so we get a flavor of that, but that's really not what we have in the United States. It's um, the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times, uh, whatever newspaper in whatever region you're in. Um, so it's hard to imagine. We do have some big TV companies, ABC, for instance, in America, uh, CBS, NBC, the, the, the um, cable networks, those are national, but they're all private. So it's, it's hard to imagine a, a, a federally funded national news organization. I, I can't imagine what it would look like. 
Um, we have a question probably for Connor um, from Michaela. Truth is, a, truth is significant when reporting. Do you believe Australian legislation such as contempt of court or scandalising the court significantly impacts on negatively on the Australian people and media, specifically in the case of Pell and the DPP letters sent out to media outlets? Um, so, Michaela, I'm sorry, could I just have the start of the question again? Again, so it was contempt of court and scandalising the court? Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Look, I, I'm not entirely sure about the story with the Pell letters uh, because I was in the US. Um, so I was only kind of following that from afar. But what I will, what I have experienced is that contempt of court has been a threat to my reporting um, and to many other reporters in that... Um, a court can compel you to reveal a source and that as a journalist, you have a responsibility not to. Um, you end up in contempt of court pretty quickly and um, journalists have gone to jail um, for that in Australia. Um, I think, you know, balancing the ledger, um, there have been cases too where journalists have reported um, irresponsibly uh, in court and in clear um, violations of the rules and there's been trials that have had to start over again um, because of that so we need to to do better on that from our side um, but I yeah I have to say covering large criminal cases in the US like the um, Bill Cosby case uh, and the case of Mohammed Noor, a police officer who shot an Australian woman. Um, I much preferred reporting under those conditions um, where we were able to give um, our viewers and readers context around what was happening in court um, in ways where if, if I'd reported like I did over there on those cases, I'd probably would have been locked up over here. I um, don't think that's an exaggeration. What were you doing exactly? What kind of reporting would get you in jail here? Uh, so in Australia, um, basically the onus is much more on the journalist and the media operator not to prejudice the jury. So you are limited to reporting only what the jury hears in court. Um, so in both the Cosby case and the Muhammad Noor case, they were quite big cultural moments with a lot of things happening outside of court that were relevant to them that we were able to talk about uh, as the case proceeded. And certainly in Minneapolis, um, the judge made it very clear that the onus was on the jury not to consume any media uh, and asked every day in court about that. Whereas here, um, the onus is, is shared and journalists can get in a lot of trouble for um, publishing a report that could prejudice a jury. That is, uh, that's interesting. Okay, um, I did a, a series of columns at the time. I was writing columns about a about a murder at a car wash late one night, uh, three three young people shot a guy and, and he bled out at the car wash. And during the course of that, I used a, a confidential source and the uh, defense attorney for the, the trigger man uh, took me to court to get me to expose the source, which I declined to do. And he tried finding me in contempt of court for refusing to reveal the, uh, reveal the source. And the judge uh, threw, threw it out, uh, said I could protect the, the source, and uh, the case went to trial um, without, without anyone knowing who that source was. Well, I'm, um, I'm envious, I have to say. Um, I had a similar situation where uh, in a criminal case, I was being compelled to reveal a source, and we had a, uh, a summons and essentially, you know, had to turnover material um it, it didn't identify the source and luckily i never actually was in that moment in court where i had a judge you know saying hand it over or you're going to be in, in contempt but it, it has happened and it is um something most working australian journalists are very uh, concerned about and that's that's one of the issues with the, the problems with the citizen journalists. They don't have the resources of the company behind them who's going to pay the attorney, you know, five hundred dollars an hour to to sit on this for as long as it takes. The, the citizen journalist, you know, he has no resources, uh, no money, and he can be clamped down very very quickly. 
Certainly, and um, and also, you know, some basic training. You know, when I was a cadet, we did rounds, we did police rounds, court rounds, we did a lot of the basics of um, daily news and, mm -hmm. um, you know, learn the rules and how to approach things. And um, I think we're seeing more and more um, citizen journalists and private publishers being caught up in defamation actions, um, some of which are from pretty considerable sums of money, given mm -hmm. the small audiences involved. Yep, definitely. Um, sort of on the topic of, you know, some of the issues that are faced in the Australian media landscape, especially around um, topics of offshore detention and terrorism, how do you overcome the challenge of, you know, increasing securitization of such topics? And how do you hold those governments um, to account and keep the public informed? That's a question from Liam. Um, well, Liam, yeah, I mean, it's always, um, I guess, every story has its obstacles and journalists are used to um, finding ways to um, get around them. You know, if journalists only agree to publish what governments and corporations wanted us to publish, um, we'd pretty soon be living in a very different world. Um, but it, it is a problem. And I think in Australia, you know, it's a continued problem because we just don't have that bedrock that the US has in terms of a constitutional amendment. And we have a media landscape that at times can be quite tribalized as well. And um, sometimes a lack of unity around, um, you know, seeking answers. And so that that can be a challenge too. Yep, definitely. And right. Paul, what do you think in the context of the United States around such issues like that? Um, What's important is developing sources. When I speak at college courses, and I always ask the kids there, I said, who's your target audience? And they say, well, it's the city council or it's this person or that person. And I said, no, your target audience is the source you don't know about yet. The, the person who's gonna trust your reporting on this story who will give you the confidential information for the next best story you don't know about yet. So it's important that you develop those, those relationships, as I said, you do that a lot by reputation without actually meeting your future sources. And then the, the future source will say, here's something that looks like you have some expertise in, you might be interested in this particular document. And then that will lead you down a, a, a path of discovery. And sometimes that involves uh, interviewing 100 people, uh, it involves looking at several thousand pages worth of uh, government records and that sort of thing. So that's part of the answer there. Yep, definitely. Um, another question that we have is around, I guess, COVID again. What is the press's um, role in presenting the truth around the worldwide push for mandatory me medication? So, for example, mandatory flu vaccinations um, with governments using COVID-19 as a long-term agenda. And some say that this is a human rights violation. Um, should the media be bastion on presenting both sides of the argument? or rather just supporting that kind of government agenda? And that is an anonymous question that we have. Can I take a stab at that? I mean, I understand where the, the, the person is asking the question. Do you pre present both sides of, of the argument? And, and I say, no, never present both sides of the argument. Present about all 50 sides of the argument. There's never just two sides of any argument. There's at least 50 and sometimes more. And, and you do that as best you can. You present as many as many sides of every argument as you can, and that's that's incumbent upon good journalism. Yeah, and I also just think we have um, an extra responsibility at times like this too to be accurate and to test um, claims. So I, I know um, with the push for people to take the flu vaccine that um, that was in the news today with a prominent footballer refusing to take it, and I guess. There's a lot of wild claims made at times about vaccinations. So, um, you know, interrogating those properly and um, establishing exactly what the evidence is, if any, for why, why you shouldn't um, proceed with them. Yeah, and on the question of sources, we have a question from Annette. How do good journalists verify their sources? And I guess I'll add to that. Um, how is that changing, um, you know, where we have the development of technology? How is that affecting how you guys are verifying your sources? Um, so, look, I think, um, you know, trust is key with sources and patience. Um, so I, I don't think I've ever really been in a position where I haven't taken the time to... Um, check and get to know a source before I've 
publish something that is, um, you know, groundbreaking or going out on a limb. Um, in terms of other, you know, more routine day-to-day -day stories, I'll often, you know, try and screen um, sources and potential interviewees and, um, you know, just so I can have ultimate tr transparency around any political um, affiliations or motivations um, they have. But I think, you know, getting to the motivation of a source is key and just, you know, being patient and taking time to establish and maintain um, that relationship. And, you know, journalism is a lot of the time about triangulation. So um, looking at what the source is telling you and then trying to verify it yourself from um, as many other different outlets and angles as you can. I, I agree with everything Connor said. You have to um, spend as much time backgrounding your sources as uh, the people you're writing about just to understand what their motivations are, um, why they're coming to you with, with information. And you can't be beholden to them. Uh, just a simple example, I was covering a, a particular city in Arizona once and I got to know one of the city councilmen pretty well and he had actually turned me on to a couple of good stories. And we went to a meeting, I can't remember what the meeting was, but uh, it was hot and I, didn't happen to have any cash that day. And I got to the bar and I was going to buy a bottle of water and discovered I didn't have any cash. He said, Oh, Paul, I'll take care of that for you. You know, it's only $2. And I said, no, 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 I'm not going to take your $2 for this water. I'll, I'll go without water. And he said, well, why would you do that? I said, because I don't want to be holding to you until, you know, one day I have to write something about you that you're not going to appreciate. And he said, Oh, that'll never happen. But it did happen. Not right away. It was a year and a half later or something like that. But he was, um, he was, embezzling money essentially and so I wrote about that and so you can't be um, too beholden to your sources you have to um, throw them under the bus if they needed to. Yeah um, following on from that we have a question from Liam um, how do you think technology will affect journalism and its access to information as a medium and the privacy and safety of whether it be your journalists or whether it be your informants? Um, yeah, that's a really good question. And I just realised, Liam, that, I that that was part of the last question too and I forgot to answer it. Um, it's increasingly um, a problem um, and a challenge for us. Um, we use encrypted apps, but, um, you know, how... Basically, I don't think you can guarantee that any kind of electronic communication is 100% um, foolproof these days. So... Um, Quite often I'll try and meet sources face to face and um, this isn't part of my routine work but where it's particularly sensitive, um, tell them to leave their phone at home um, or turn it off. Um, but yeah, it's, it's more and more a huge challenge um, basically and I know sources are concerned um, increasingly about that and about reaching out to us. At ABC we've tried to set up um, systems that are as secure as possible um, in protecting people's identity when they uh, give us tips, particularly on the investigative side um, of what we do. But again, you know, I, 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 I don't know if I could say to any of them that we could we probably, you know, 95% guarantee protecting their anonymity, but um, the way the laws are here and, you know, the lack of protection and the increasing, um, surveillance and use of metadata is um, a really big challenge. Yep, definitely. Um, Paul, did you have anything to add on that? Um, just from the American point of view, um, for a lot of government agencies, uh, big and small, uh, there, are, there are rules regulating information that can be shared by someone who works for the agency. So a lot of times those apply more to the employees of the agency rather than to, to the journalists. The journalists can take the information as long as they're not encouraging someone to steal it. Um, and, and court cases have tested that. Yeah. Um, we actually have another question on the subject of representing arguments. Um, how do you explain the overrepresentation of climate deniers in reporting the urgency of climate change? A lot of people have kind of, you know, raised both COVID and, you know, the climate change emergency as, you know, two topical areas that are being reported quite differently when they're both emergencies, as some would classify. Honor. You want to go first, Paul? Um, 
Well, that kind of gets back to what I said earlier about representing all 50 points of view. Yes, you should represent all 50 points of view, but put them in context. So not all 50 points of view are, are equal. Yeah, I, I would say similar. Um, the, you know, um, climate change is an issue that, you know, I was a former national environment reporter and um, it provokes incredibly strong passions in people, um, particularly if they feel they're not being heard to the point of, you know, um, not just abuse, but correspondence bordering on death threats. Um, you know, I think more and more, you know, you just stick with the established science. And I think um, the ABC has done a pretty good job of um, reflecting what the scientific consensus is. I know that people sometimes get frustrated that climate change isn't leading a bulletin every night. Um, but the fact is that's just, you know, not the way news works and um, it's not, you know, what our audience is, is most interested in. And ultimately, you know, the audience, um, is the king so diplomatic answer <laughs> um we have another question from reshma what is the one thing that you would change around the workings of journalism today uh, i'm going to sound like a broken record but introduce the first amendment in australia and how about in the context of the states or even around the world um say so in the states or around the world, um, I would say similar, you know, press freedoms, basically. Um, one thing I've noticed is more and more a tendency for people to only want to communicate with people that agree with their views. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say, you know, I'd like that to change more too and for people to um, be able to disagree with each other without seeing that as an attack um, and to be able to engage with each other more on the strength of their arguments, um, but yeah, that might be wishful thinking. I would, I would agree with everything you said there. But in addition to that, and I don't know what the story is here in Australia, but it's often tough to make a living and raise a family being a journalist in the United States. So I think for journalism to survive, to, to keep talented people in the profession, uh, the wages need to go up considerably. And on the topic of, I guess, access to journalism as a profession, we had one question raised earlier about the questions around diversity in journalism. You know, um, in the traditional news media, we've kind of seen, you know, a certain homogenous type of person end up, um, you know, on the screens. How do we increase that access to, you know, journalism as a profession? Is it citizen journalism or should we be changing other systems? Um, yeah, look, it's a very good question. Um, I think, it's a really complex question too. Um, I think um, I'm, I'm sure the question is probably alluding to uh, white men um, being seen to be dominant in the industry. Um, but I think um, the ABC where I work has uh, initiatives like the 5050 project where we are trying to, um, you know, use as experts in our stories, um, uh, women and men equally and to encourage like all of our reporters to be thinking about that when they're approaching the story. Um, I know in terms of its hiring practices, um, the ABC's, you know, certainly trying to diversify and widen its pool of staff. Um, personally, I also think the problem is an economic one um, as well as a colour problem uh, in that um, journalism is increasingly becoming um, a pursuit for uh, the children of wealthier families because, um, as Paul mentioned, um, the pay and oftentimes um, the requirement for graduates to do months and months of unpaid internships. Um, so I think, um, you know, the economic um, access of what used to be a trade and has now become something open to graduates is, um, you know, um, would also improve diversity in the industry. Yep. Um, I guess we need to wrap up around about now. We'll end with one last question and that's from Helen. Um, well, I guess you guys are on the TV. Um, how do you actually 
see um, as your favorite newspaper or journalism movie and why? Which one is it? <laughs> oh, that's a really good question. Um, can, do you have your answer front of mind, Paul? Can I think about mine for a second? I can think of a couple good ones. Um, yeah. um, All the President's Men, uh, about Bob mm -hmm. Woodward and, and Carl Bernstein, both of whom I've had uh, the opportunity to meet. Um, that's a good one. It talks about the nuts and bolts of journalism. And that's about Richard Nixon, uh, which I talked about earlier. In addition to that, um, recently, a movie called Spotlight about yeah. the Spotlight. In, in Boston. Um, those are two, two good movies. Oh, and The Post yeah. is another good one that came out recently. Those yeah. Three for you. Yeah, and there's another movie, um, I think it's Veronica Guerin, about an Irish journalist. Um, oh, I know that one. Who was still reporting on crime. Yeah, that's definitely up there with my favourites, probably that and Spotlight um, and All the President's Men. I thought The Post for me was, um, I went in expecting a lot and I kind of got about 80% of it. Um, but, okay. Well, there's my movie picks. <laughs> <laughs> well, Daniel in the comments actually got you to a T, Paul, all the President's Men in Spotlight. I mean, like, that is some weird stuff there. Um, so thank you so much for your time, and thank you for giving, sharing all of your insights and your stories. Um, I appreciate it, and I'm sure our audience appreciates it as well. And thank you for our attendees um, for providing us with these amazing questions and spending a little bit of their morning with us. So well, I guess you. see you for the next one. It's been a lot of fun. Thank you very much. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. Thanks so much for having me. Awesome. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.